Welcome, everybody, to yet another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. And today, we are going to revisit a star that we have visited many times on the show, and that is the great Anne Dvorak. And I am so lucky to have her biographer and her historian and collector, Christina Rice, with us, and also her daughter, Gable, who is also a Hollywood Kitchen contributor. And thank you, ladies, so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having us once again. I hope people aren't sick. The longtime Hollywood Kitchen viewers are not sick of Anne yet, but I always appreciate the opportunity to talk about her. So thank you. Yes, and this was actually the first, Anne Dvorak and you were the first official episode I did of Hollywood Kitchen. So it's kind of fun to circle around again periodically and revisit Anne because she's a very fascinating person. There's always a lot to talk about. Yeah, she is. And I think it's, it's, it kind of started becoming a tradition because Anne's birthday is in August. But mm -hmm. last year uh, we were going to do it. And I unfortunately crashed my bike and mangled my face. So we did it last year. And this year you were supposed to come over. But um, we have been recovering from COVID, which we caught in at Disney World. Disney World. So maybe next year he'll be actually be able to come over and we'll do it in the house. <laughs> yes, and it is the dog days of summer. I only have air conditioning in my bedroom and nowhere else in my home. So I'm kind of sweaty and gross right now. I apologize. Kind of doing the best I can. But my, this is the time of year when my stove is basically a storage facility and I'm not using it at all, which makes this end of work recipe quite perfect for days like today. Yes. Now we've had a little bit of internet discussion leading up to this episode about the pronunciation of Anne's name. So I think we should just clear the air once and for all, Christina, and tell us how that name is pronounced. Okay, so it's the, are you ready? Settle in. So um, it, it was a stage name. So and she was actually born Anna McKim. So it was a name she adopted. She, she claimed it was on her mother's side of the family because her mother was um, from Czechoslovakia or Austro-Bohemia, um, but I've never been able to prove that. Um, as far as I can tell, the pronunciation over the years was Dvorak. So she first adopted it when she was a chorus girl at MGM. And so I have um, some newspaper appearances. I have one magazine cover. I have stills. And she is credited as Anne Dvorak, D-E-V-O-R-A-K. And that is like consistently the pronunciation while she is at MGM as a contract player and a chorus girl, which indicates Dvorak was how she was pronouncing it. Um, when she gets signed by Howard Hughes in 1931, um, she signs her contract D apostrophe V-O-R-I-K. So I think that could maybe go either way, you know, Vorjak or Dvorak. Um, and then more recently last year, the 1950 census was released to the public because the census gets released every 72 years for privacy purposes. And back in the days, you know, now we fill out a form ourselves and send it in. And at that time, though, there were people that knocked on the doors and whoever answered the door gave the name and they would write it down phonetically. And so in 1950, Anne was living by herself. And when you look at the 1950 census, what does the census taker write down? Dvorak, D-E-V-O-R-I-K, or might be D-A-V-O-R-I-K. Um, so I think it's Dvorak. That's how I've always pronounced it. So where the confusion comes in is that there was, um, a book called what's the name that was published like in the 1930s. And there is a reference to a quote in literary digest. I still have yet to be able to find the original literary digest quote, but in this book, what's the name? There's this quote from Anne saying, my name is properly pronounced Dvorak. The D is silent. So um, I think if that really is a quote from her, I think it was something that was really early on when she adopted it. And maybe she was playing around with the pronunciation, but nobody ever called her that. But that quote, somebody threw on Wikipedia like 20 years ago. So because this incredibly obscure quote was put on Wikipedia, um, people are now very insistent that it's Borjak. Um, to me, it, it's... it's it's just a weird thing that kind of rankles me because anytime somebody posts a picture of her, somebody chimes in with her name's properly pronounced Borjak. And that all harkens back to this incredibly obscure quote that happens to be on Wikipedia and everybody takes the internet as gospel. So um, I unfortunately don't have any instance of her on tape saying it. 
Um, I do have a, a radio show she did and somebody introduces her as Deborah and she's not correcting them. And Robert Osborne always pronounced it Deborah. So maybe she wanted it Borjak really early on. The common pronunciation has always been Dvorak. And so that's what I stick with. So um, if I ever post a picture of Anne, please don't come into my comments and say it's pronounced uh, Dvorak with a silent D. Someone, well, asked, someone who also struggles with name issues, I think sometimes the simpler is the better way to go when it comes to the spelling and pronunciation too of a name. And so it's just, um, I'm sorry, after like 25 years of, you know, having this broad be an everyday part of my life, I'm going with Dvorak. What's up, Giggle? Someone asked if there's any connection to Dvorak, the composer. No, I think she she also claimed to be a relative of his. And somebody I interviewed for my book um, uh, talked to Anne's dad at one point and he laughed it off saying no, like she, Anne was a fan of his, but not related to him at all. Some of the stars, um, Louise Brooks had a quote that said, from the beginning, the truth was not in them. And so I think they kind of spun these mythologies that have created a lot of myths and confusion that people like us have to work really hard to straighten out. So, okay. so Dvorak, guys, Dvorak. Christina has spoken. Christina has spoken. <laughs> okay, so the recipe, I always like to start with the recipe early on. And, you know, some of these I find in cookbooks this particular one I found on the Media History Digital Lantern website, and it is actually taken from Screenland Magazine, August of 1935. So it's 88 years ago this month. And it's one of those spreads where Anne Dvorak at home, and she's in an apron and looking like she's cooking, although it talks about her cook making her things. <laughs> and Awesome. And uh, this recipe is for log cabin salad. And in it, she talks about how her cook prepared this for she and Leslie Fenton for breakfast. And it was such a lovely breakfast treat. So basically, um, you peel and cut lengthwise four bananas. I'm just going to do one. It's just me. Place in orange juice for half an hour in the ice box. Then put bananas on individual serving plates, log cabin fashion. I'm not sure what that means exactly and fill the centers with whole clean strawberries. Okay, so I did my banana here. I'm gonna just bend my computer screen down so you can see it, but I don't wanna spill orange juice. Are we gonna, are we gonna assemble right now, Carrie? Cause I'll get my- Assemble get, right now. You wanna get our bananas out of the ice box? Yeah, I can't get out. Okay. So I think you'll grab a spoon. And I were talking about before we went live, some people may not know ice box. It used to literally be a box with a huge block of ice you would put in there. And some of you may remember Three Stooges and Laurel and Hardy, where there's a joke where they have the ice and then it's like a little bitty ice cube by the time they get up the stairs. So yes, that's that's kind of why they used to say ice box. My fridge is on the fritz right now and it's super cold. So my fridge is kind of an ice box. Yes, it is. Oh my Do you want to hand me that and then the, the strawberries? Yeah, I'm gonna okay. Have to back. okay. Okay, so I have hold out my banana. I have soaked it in orange juice. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's my bananas that are soaking in orange juice. There's Gable tripping over the piano. <laughs> okay. All right. Ready to assemble? Ready to assemble. Okay, so fill the centers with whole clean strawberries. When I was first working on this, I took out the center part of the strawberry and I was trying to just put the strawberry on, but the strawberries were kind of big and it just didn't really work. So I've cut I, mine up into a lot of little pieces. I cut mine up. I didn't hold, see, I almost took it as assemble it as a log cabin and then in the middle. Yes, yes what I thought. That's, we, that's how we interpreted it. You stack it like with like log cabin. All right. on the end. Let's assemble and we'll compare and contrast. <laughs> Anne was not a cook. I think we have a lot of creative license here to assemble as we see fit. So, okay, I have whipped cream in a can. So I'm gonna, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna build. You wanna build our log cabin? Yeah. I'm gonna build our log cabin with whipped cream. By the way, I was gonna tell you because I know your daughter Gable's a Girl Scout. When I was a little girl, we had a, a dessert. Sorry, I'm getting off track for a moment. It was called the banana boat, and we would take a banana and we'd hole out the center like a canoe. And we'd mm -hmm. fill it with tiny little chocolate chips and marshmallows, Gable. And then we would wrap it up in aluminum foil and then we'd cook it on our campfire. Yeah, we oh, I we've definitely done aluminum foil camping, but not with bananas. 
It's called the banana boat. That's pretty cool. I don't yeah, know. So I kind of was thinking of that this morning when I was holding out my, my banana here. Okay, so I'm going to take strawberries and start placing them inside the hole of my particular um, thing here. I don't know everywhere. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> but yeah, this, res this uh, recipe is 88 years old as of this month. Are this you month. enjoying it? Okay. Wait, they can't see the assembly so much. Just, oh, okay, no. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll see us building this. You're doing some. Okay. Are you going to do this again, or do you want me to do it? Yes. You let me do. Are you doing it? Okay. <laughs> get out of the way. Oh, that's better. I did it right. Okay. Oh, okay. I I took log cabin style symbols like how like you have like those blocks and you put like one and then you do a sideways one and then you do like the other one and then you do a sideways one. That sounds like it would take forever though, doesn't it? I know it's like stacking. I loved Lincoln logs when I was a kid. Where you yeah, put like those. Ears, I feel like they meant like Lincoln logs style. I love Lincoln logs as a kid. Okay, that's what I took. <laughs> <laughs> I thought log cabin meant. I didn't know that. I saw that log cabin like Lincoln log, where it's like you have like the block. There's no the picture on your recipe, right, Carrie? Who's yeah, Robert? picture. It's all text in the um the article. So yeah, yeah there's nothing to go on, which again <laughs> leaves it vastly <laughs> open to interpretation. Yeah. Okay. So here is our interpretation. Lost <laughs> <laughs> strawberries. Big with lost strawberries. Okay. Pretty nice. What do you think? Not bad? I think that looks good. Now it says serve with French dressing or whipped cream. So I'm going to take my whipped cream and mm -hmm. just, I guess I'll just plop it in the orange juice for lack of a, a better game plan here. You get, oh, you do it. oh, so you have more. Oh, so you're keeping it in oh. orange juice. Should I dump some no, orange juice? No, so. I mean, again, it doesn't see, it says place in orange juice for half an hour. Oh, it never says it's, to take it out. Someone says it's built like Lincoln Logs. Right. I was I don't know how porous bananas are in terms of soaking up said orange juice. No, let me put I, I am not bit. sure. Okay, this so is, I'm gonna, too much. I'll put, so I'll eat are you gonna eat some of this? I'll eat the I'll eat the strawberries. Well, you'll eat the bananas too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as someone says it's but like a long size. I'm right. What do you think? Oh, I, I think should, this part does I not think I should have I shouldn't have done the orange juice. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. See, I'm right. Here, wait. And wait. This. What are you doing? Take your desk away. Here, take a pic. Here. Yeah. Make sure we get the final picture, Gable. Oh. Get a okay. get a final okay. picture. I'm gonna get a photo of mine too. Sure. Are you gonna? Okay. <laughs> that way we can try it. You compare and contrast uh, and Borak interpretations here. here. Gary, hold up yours. Okay. Let me. Yeah. Adjust it so I can see yours. All right. There you go. Okay. Okay. Right. All right. Should I grab spoons or something? Oh, did you want to try? You want to try? It? I'm gonna eat this part. You need to try the banana too. <laughs> like we're just. Yeah. I'm gonna try some of mine as well. I feel like I should attempt to eat this on camera. So uh, here. Wait, here, here. No, I'm gonna grab a spoon. You don't want the banana? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. gonna. Eat the part of it sounds good. Strawberries and whipped cream. No, the orange juice is good. It kind of like. It's a little bit like an orange Julius. Like a what? An orange Julius? Yeah. Oh, I don't think you've had the pleasure, my dear. Hmm. Go get orange juice all over my strawberries. No, yeah, it's okay. Orange Julius was definitely our generation at the mall and stuff. That was such a big thing. Come sit down. Bad? I think it's good. Yeah. It's healthy. Yeah. yeah. Fat free whipped cream. Or no sugar, zero sugar whipped cream. Okay. okay. Don't eat all the strawberries though, and leaving only the banana. I'm gonna use over the plate. Hold on, one second. So, having completed the recipe, we can now yeah. do a deep dive into all things Anne. Yes. So we've gone over a lot of stuff about Anne in the past, but there's always so much more. Mm -hmm. So, do you have a new angle or a new part of Anne's life and career you'd like to talk about today, or should we kind of revisit? kind of some different things that we've already already covered. What are you feeling like? I, I don't know. I don't know if people, um, do we have comments? I don't know if people who are here today have um, been on the previous episodes or know much about Anne or if they so. remember <laughs> actually retain anything about Anne. So um, we could certainly revisit, you know, one of the things, you know, because I, I did write a book on her. Mm-hmm. 
that came out almost 10 years ago. And so once it came out, um, a lot of people said, oh, you're going to have all this information that you didn't find. And, and really, there hasn't been that much, which is kind of nice. <laughs> kind of what I wrote, I think, still kind of holds. So there hasn't been a lot that that's really come to light in the last 10 years. So if we want to, I have this too. So if we want to, um, yeah. So if we want to revisit Anne, um, I'm cool with that. Sure. Well, I first heard of Anne when I was in film school because we were watching a lot of pre-codes and I saw three out of match and I was just like, who is this? I mean, she outshines Betty Davis, Joan Blondell, not easy to do. I mean, that's really her movie and they're kind of supporting players with vastly less interesting roles. Yeah. And I remember thinking, I got to see more. And then I saw Scarface. But then, unfortunately, there's not nearly as many good roles for her thereafter. There are more character roles or throwaway roles, et cetera. But I've always been fascinated by her because I thought she I thought she had so much talent. And she's just kind of such and she's beautiful, but not in a completely conventional way. She's got like this striking presence on screen. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like your experience with Anne is pretty much my experience with Anne. So Anne, three on a match was also definitely like my gateway. And yeah, her performance in that, I don't know that I've ever been just so kind of blindsided by a, by a performance. So it's the same thing where my, I was just jaw dropped and couldn't believe I hadn't heard of her. Saw Scarface was the second one. And then G-Men, this was in the mid nineties. And so when I tried to find out more about her, um, that's, you know, I, I just couldn't there just wasn't you know it's the early days of the internet and there wasn't a lot of information and her movies were hard to come by um so yeah so that was when you know I just kind of came to realize that a um nobody else was actually collecting on her because she was so obscure and I realized even though I was a starving college student I could start collecting on her and that you know there had been some articles about her so you had you know these these you know film magazines that were popping up in the 60s and then kind of like the um the film journals and she she might get mentioned in those or had some write ups in those but otherwise nobody had really done a deep dive into her life and career and so I just figured, well, maybe I'm the one to do it. And it's been, you know, I've been collecting on her for almost 26 years now. Um, you know, I think I've seen almost all of her films. There are a couple that are considered lost that she made um, during the war that were distributed by RKO. But I agree. I think, you know, she is incredibly striking. She's very contemporary. So I feel like you could pick Anne up and stick her in a movie today. And, you know, she did not have, you know, I think in the early 30s and the early sound days, you had a lot of actors that it was a tough adjustment because they were silent acting or they were stage acting, whereas, you know, she was incredibly young um, and hadn't done stage and, you know, in silent acting. So I think she just comes across as natural and contemporary. Um, and yeah, I just love her to death. Absolutely. Definitely. So for people that might wonder, how come she had these two fantastic knockout performances and then didn't have a ton more like it? Because that's always kind of been my question is, what the heck happened? Yeah, that which was my question, too. So how how could she possibly? And when I first discovered her, I figured, oh, well, maybe, you know, like a lot of actresses, maybe she just married really well and retired. And that's not the case. So she ended up working until the early 50s. She made over 50 movies. Um, but, you know, and Scarface was her first acting role. So she was a chorus girl at MGM. So she made, you know, she's, she's in a couple dozen movies at MGM um, between 29 and 31. But Scarface is her first acting role, her first role, like credited on screen as Anne Dvorak, which is incredible. So she was, um, I think, just shy of 19 when she got the part. She was 20 when she filmed it, which is just absolutely amazing. And just, I think, also a testament to Howard Hawks as a director that he could get a performance like that. You know, I think Anne had a lot of raw talent, but when she worked with those really great directors. Um, what happens with Anne is that uh, in early 1932, you know, Howard Hughes, who she was under contract to, is loaning her out to Warner Brothers. And one of the movies that she makes is The Strange Love of Molly Louvain, which is another, not a great pre-code, but a, a fun pre-code. And Anne's co-star in that is a guy named Leslie Fenton, who was 10 years older than her. And they fall madly in love and they elope um, in March of 1932. And Leslie Fenton you know, was, he was the type of guy that 
he liked acting, you know, he liked acting fine, but never wanted to be tied down to a movie studio. So he never signed one of those long-term studio contracts and he loved to travel. So he had the wanderlust, you might say. And so he really viewed movies as, I think he, he regarded theater more, more highly than movies, but you can make so much money in the movies. And so he viewed movies as a way to just bank a lot of money and then go to Europe and then just come back and do it all over again. And so he desperately wanted to show Anne the world. And he convinces her to walk out on her contract in July of 1932. Um, this is not too long after Howard Hughes has sold her contract to Warner Brothers, which she wasn't happy about. Um, so they did, uh, so he, Howard Hughes sold it for $40,000. So he, he made quite a, quite a nice profit off of her. Um, you know, and I do think she was, you know, she goes from nobody to, you know, she got a heck of a lot of press and a lot of attention after Scarface come out, came out and she's 20 years old and kind of having this spotlight shine so brightly on her. So I do think to a degree, she was really overwhelmed and intimidated by her newfound fame. Um, so I think, you know, Fenton on the one hand, I think thought she was starting to crack under the pressure. Um, but I think he also just wanted to leave again. And so she walked out on her contract and they went on um, an eight month honeymoon. So they were in Europe. So they were in like Western Europe for a while. Um, he did film a movie FP1 over there, um, but they ended up going you know, down to Africa and it was just this incredible experience. And um, at one point I actually ended up getting the scrapbook of photos from that honeymoon which was, you know, really, I think this incredibly pivotal period um, in Anne's life personally. Um, I mean, it it did kind of tank her career. So she came back and Warner Brothers took her back because they paid all this money and they wanted, they certainly wanted to like work her and they worked her to death. Like they worked all of their players. So she, she makes a ton of movies when she comes back from the honeymoon in 1933, but Warner Brothers wasn't going to star her in anything and they weren't going to promote her and they, they, they weren't going to try to make her the next big thing. Um, but amazingly, I, I do own the scrapbook of photos. And so a few years ago, I did publish a book called The Inseparables, which has the honeymoon photos, um, which to this day, it always kind of blows me away that I have these photos because they're very just kind of beautiful, intimate, like lovely photos between these two people, madly in love and throwing Anne's career away. But you can order that on Amazon if you want. So, you know, again, she, she works, you know, and then she does end up actually taking Warner Brothers to court um, in late 1935 to get out of her contract. So I think she just develops a reputation for being difficult. And, you know, anytime her career would start to maybe develop some momentum, she would kind of do stuff. She would take off and kind of tank it. So she never really focused, hyper-focused on her career the way somebody like Betty Davis did. Oh, yeah. At the with Betty, like nobody could derail Betty from having that career. And so, um, I think it's kind of the other 180 degree extreme of that. The opposite. Like Betty is how you make it in Hollywood under Warner Brothers and Anne is kind of how you don't. Um, I, at the end of her life, she did seem to have some regrets about what she had done with her career. But honestly, I don't know. I think if she had to do it all over again, I don't know if Anne would have done it any different. Yeah, that makes sense. It's sad that she and Leslie Fenton eventually got a divorce though. It kind of breaks my heart, you know, and going into, you know, when I started doing initial research and I was really, you know, I was in my twenties and I, I really felt that he was the victim or that, that she was kind of this victim and he was the villain. And so I really had it in my mind that he was at fault for tanking her career. And to a degree he was, but, you know, as, cause I worked on this book from the time I was in my early twenties and it came out just shy of my 40th birthday. And, you know, as I ultimately was writing about them, by the time I'm writing about their romance, like I was married, she was already around. Um, and I ended up just developing a much more sympathetic look at him. You know, I still think he gave her terrible advice, um, but ultimately, yeah, it did make me very sad that their marriage didn't survive because um, she she really put everything into it. Definitely. And I think back in that generation, you also, whatever the man wanted to do, you just did. I don't think you questioned as much as like we would today. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, but absolutely. Absolutely. Betty Davis wouldn't though, but... <laughs> But Anne, I think Anne ended up having a more traditional view of marriage because she did end up, you know, Anne ended up being married three times. And with all the three, I think 
Fenton had a huge amount of influence over her. Um, but I think in the case of all three marriages, that, that was often the case where her career ended up kind of taking a back seat to, um, to the husbands. So well, it's a little off topic, but I just read a Mae Murray biography by Michael Anchorage. Oh, and great. her third husband, or maybe it was the fourth, um, I forget. Anyway, she probably would too. Um, Devani or Midvani, I forget how you pronounce that, but he basically told her to walk out on MGM at the peak of her career. And that's what she did. And it never got better from there. And it was like this irony that he didn't want to work, but he didn't want her to work, but somebody had to pay the bills. That so- was Anne, that was the same thing with Anne's third husband because Anne, you know, retired pretty, Anne retired, you know, fairly early. I mean, she was um, around 40 when she retired, but it was the same thing. Like her third husband didn't want to work. So I, I don't, and I get the impression that's, maybe one of the reasons she was retired but because of him but at the same time yeah like they needed money so I don't understand why like why she retired or like you know why he wouldn't have just made her constantly work so but yeah so she really, you you mentioned one time to me how she wrote about how much she regretted her career decisions and her uh, papers that you found later on yeah. So one of the items in my collection is I have a journal that she kept toward, towards the end of her life. It only has, I think has one entry, but in the entry she, and it was, if it's from 77, she dies in 79. And she actually kind of sums up her feelings about her life in this journal entry. It was just incredible. Um, it was like, you know, the universe was giving me this like way to just kind of tie up the book. And, but she does say like, I threw my life and career out the window. So, so I think, you know, she did that, but again, I don't know that she would have done it any different if she had to do it over again. I don't know if she would. Phrase hindsight's 2020. Like it's so easy to sit around and look back at your life. And I do this to her and go, oh, I should have done this. And oh, why did I do that? And, but I think most of us probably make the best decisions we can at the time with the information and knowledge that we have at that time. Yeah, and the perspective in our just pers- our worldview at that time. So and we have no way of knowing what lies ahead. I mean, no, the pandemic will happen. Yeah, you know, and for as much as that, like that honeymoon, app, I, you know, yeah, and I think it absolutely tanked her career. I still think it was. I get the impression it was the happiest period of her entire life. You know, and Anne later on, Anne was not somebody who would look back. So, you know, I did, um, I did manage to track down a couple of people who knew her later on. She, she retired to Hawaii and, you know, one of the, I knew somebody who knew her up until the end of her life. And he he said, nah, she, she, she she didn't talk about her film career. Like she didn't want to, if she ever did kind of mention something about the past, like she would mention the honeymoon. Oh, back when Les, Les and I were doing, you know, so that was the one thing. And, um, you know, and I did, I, I tracked down this antique dealer who got the contents of her storage unit after she died. Um, and it was a lot of things related to her. It was like publicity photos related to her film career. And, but the honeymoon photos, I mean, that was something she still kept in her apartment. So that came, so she had those photos with her in her apartment at the time of her passing. So I think even all those years later and, and what the consequences of the honeymoon meant, I think it was still, you know, a memorable and meaningful period of her life. We just never know what's ahead of us in life. I mean, you don't. And oh my God, like traveling Europe for eight months with like somebody you're madly in love with, like when you're 21 years old. I mean, like, who would say no to that? I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have either. Yeah, not not at all. Not mm-hmm. at all. Do you have any questions or just comments? Just comments. Just comments. Okay. <clears throat> okay. What are they saying, Gabel? Miss Will do so. She was saying like hi and Anne is intriguing. Um is. someone said that they still have uh their great grandmother's ice box. Oh we're talking oh. about the ice boxes. <laughs> someone did say that it is and the same person said it is built like Lincoln Logs, so they've built it before and it prevents oh. the banana from turning brown. Oh, oh interesting. Uh, yeah, that's kind of it. That's kind of it. Um, so I did pull out some things from my collection that I don't think I've pulled out before. I think some of them are, are newer, but what I thought would be a little bit fun is I went and kind of dug up my photos of Anne with food <laughs> or with kitchen appliances. Kitchen appliances. Oh, I have another, I've got, oh, I have a question. Oh, question. Okay. Was she living comfortably and well at the end of her life? 
Um, at the end of her life, she she was on a fixed income. Um, so after she died, there was an article in the National Enquirer, which I think it's kind of amazing that the National Enquirer thought she was newsworthy enough in 1979 to write about her. And as you would expect, it's, it, was, it was a terrible article, um, just painting her in the worst you know, possible light and that she was like in poverty and, you know, on the verge of being out on the streets and that she was paranoid and it was pretty awful. Um, she was definitely on a fixed income. So she had her social security and she had um, her SAG pension. I think there were times where she did have to rely on some government assistance like food stamps. Um, her last husband really um, blew through whatever money, you know, and she had real estate. I mean, she owned property in Malibu in the fifties and all that went away. So unfortunately she was not as comfortable as she should have been considering, you know, the amount of money and that she seemed to make some decent, um, investments early on, but that kind of went away with, with the last husband. So, you know, she was living in an apartment, um, on Waikiki beach and it was an area called the jungle, where I think like a lot of hippies hung out and, you know, they're, they're, it might have not been the most savory, but I mean, it's still like Waikiki beach. How, like, I don't know how terrible it could be. Um, how much could that suck? But, <laughs> how much could that possibly suck? Yeah. So maybe it was like a little bit dicey in the late seventies, but you're still, you're still in Waikiki. Um, you know, and I know there have been people over the years that have just been insistent that no, she was just in poverty and that, you know, in her apartment, she just had, you know, a bare bulb like hanging. And I have photos of her apartment and she had lamps with shades and they worked. <laughs> so um people want the pitiful situation. They, they kind they of crave it. that pathetic skid row kind of story for something. Yeah. So no, it wasn't ideal. I think, you know, a lot of the decisions that she made during the course of her life, like left her to that. But, you know, at the time that she died, if I'm remembering, if I'm remembering correctly, she had at least a thousand dollars in the bank and that's in 1979. She might've had as much as 3000. I don't quite remember. You know, so she had enough money to keep the roof over her head and to pay the bills. Um, you know, and ultimately, um, you know, cause she, she did die in a hospital and her estate paid for her hospital bills. So, you know, at the end, Anne, Anne was self-sufficient and took care of herself, but, um, was she, you know, Dorothy McHale living at the Royal Hawaiian, you know, up the street? No, she, she wasn't, but, um, it, it wasn't, you know, it, it, it should have been better, but it wasn't as bad as some people hope it would be. Yeah. Would anyone want to see someone in dire circumstances? I don't mm. get that. I don't know. But on a happier note, here's Anne with fudge. <laughs> Ooh, nice. And I do have a fudge recipe that I made. So when I um when my book came out in November of 2013, we had a big um book release party at Central Library in downtown Los Angeles, because that's where I work. And so I did make a number of Anne Dvorak recipes. Um, the fudge has molasses in it. So the fudge didn't go. <laughs> so there was fudge left over. So that wasn't the best. Um, and I do have, so this is what you've used to promote the show, but I do have this original photo of Anne at her home in Encino with her little food spread. Um, so she she did have a garden and she would grow vegetables. So supposedly she would have meals, um, you know, with the things grown in her garden. And then I do have some photos of her. So here she is I think with an ice box. Yay, I really want an ice box, a refrigerator like that one. I love that. And Gable and I were at Disney World a couple of weeks back where they have at the Magic Kingdom, they have the Carousel of Progress. So we learned all about ice boxes on the Carousel it's of Progress. It's a great big beautiful tomorrow. It is. Shiny at the end of every day. <laughs> I love you. And then here's, here's a stove. So this is- I love uh, stove too. Isn't that great? So this is from, oh. yeah. I think the photo's from around 33. So that's like a 1930s stove. And then we move forward a little bit and here we are in the late 1930s. Look at that. What a ritzy setup. Mm -hmm. So this is weird publici publicity for Merrily We Live. Mm -hmm. And then our last one is Anne, like in her actual kitchen in the 40s. Very cool. Very nice. There's a bowl there. It's a, a colander, so she's, ah. which kind of looks like the one my grandma had growing up. Okay. So I'm sure my grandma's probably was from the 40s and she kept it the whole time. So there's some photos of Anne, my photos of Anne with food and appliances. 
someone for the person that missed the name of her book it's Anne Dvorak Hollywood's Forgotten Rebel thank you you're hired give me your book I'll show it all I'll just hold it up Abel's a book publicist yes Anne Dvorak Hollywood's Forgotten Rebel if you like it you can check out um Mean Moody Magnificent about Jane Russell also written by her we we should kind of probably plug that also since you are sitting in front of a gigantic Jane Russell photo from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes (laughs) of Marilyn Monroe Yes. Yeah. So I did write my follow up book was on Jane Russell, which was a hoot to write. Um, You know, Anne, I really had to like dig and dig and dig and dig and dig for information. And Jane, there was, you know, I I practically, you know, died under the avalanche of information on Jane. So it was a very different experience writing about these two women um, who were both discovered by um, Howard Hawks and um, signed by Howard Hughes. So there were some some interesting parallels between the two and that was kind of fun to write about. Very cool. I have a question. Like when you are doing these biographies, how do you organize your time? Because I've only done two books and they're photo caption books, but I find it's like a whole nother job. And when you've already got a job and then you're trying to juggle a book, which feels like a job, it just feels like you're trying to scale Mount Everest. It's just so crazy to try to organize your time to get this stuff done. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that that certainly is a challenge. And with, I have to say, like, having a child made me much more efficient. Um, I'm great like that. <laughs> yes, I guess so. Yeah. But, um, you know, because I've been working on Anne for, you know, a really long time be- before she was born. Um, you know, and it was my first time writing a book. And so... I think I, I initially had approached Anne with, um, I wanted my first draft to be a final draft, which is really silly. But as I was writing it, I was just trying to make it perfect and trying to find the perfect quotes. And when you do that, it takes a long time to actually see progress. And so yeah, I would get pretty discouraged. So it took me like a few years just to get through like the first five chapters. And it was just, I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to get this book done. And then I had her. And once I had a baby, I realized, oh my God, I was wasting so much time. Like I just wasted time. And I had to just really kind of take a hard look and say, you know, I I need to, you know, and the whole time, like I launched an Anne Dvorak website in 2002. Um, So I'd been promoting myself as Anne Dvorak's biographer for a number of years. And I realized I just needed to either figure out a way to write the book or I just needed to actually come to terms with the fact that maybe I wasn't, or maybe I wasn't going to do it for a number of years. And I really wanted to do it, you know, because I am very, you know, I I love Anne and I wanted her story told and was very invested in it. And so um, I just had to figure out when I could do it. And at the time, as I said, you know, I live in the Valley and I work downtown. And at the time I was taking the subway to work. And so that was one of the things I sat down. I thought, well, when do I have uninterrupted time? during my day. And it was that subway ride. So it was 22 minutes, you know, each way. Um, And then I had at work, I had, you know, you know, about 45 minutes during lunch at work. And I just said, you know what, I'm just going to write. I am just, I just have to write and just started writing. And it wasn't, it was sloppy and it wasn't perfect. But by that time I knew Anne's story so well that um, I had you know, every every piece of information I had found on Anne, I had logged in a spreadsheet. So I had a timeline. So I kind of had a skeleton of her life. Um, and so I just like wrote it out and wrote out, I wrote out, I don't even know, like 30,000 words, like in a couple of months, just writing on the train. And once you start to see the progress, you really get motivated. Um, and then I just, and the thing that once you get into like a rhythm and so, you know, once I really had to write that final draft and make it perfect and have all my quotes put in, it was just, um, it was just a routine. So like every night I would come, you know, I work full time. So I'd come home from work, you know, I would take care of her, um, have dinner, clean up. And then it was like, okay, all right, guys, I need to now sit at my desk and just work on this book. And so I, you know, and once you get into the routine of it, like it, it actually just becomes so second nature. Like, oh, this is what I'm doing now. Like, I'm not going out. I'm not, you know, I want to get this done. 
but it's hard to get into the routine. And so once, you know, so I, so I did, and the research is fun. Like I'm a researcher, I'm a librarian and I'm a researcher, so I can do research, no problem. Like I can, you know, research till the cows come home, but it's just organizing it all in writing is like just pulling teeth. And when I sat down to write the Jane Russell book, I went, I don't, how do I do this? Like I wrote a book, how did that happen? Like it, it blew me away that I wrote a book and I just, my initial thought was I can't do this, but, but I had. So again, it's just like forcing yourself to just get into a routine. Um, you know, so I've been like researching another book and I just have not been able to like, again, just, I have to just, you know, and it's just letting everybody around you know that, hey, it's not personal, but you're not going to see me. Like, you know, if you want to invite, please invite me. I'm probably going to say no, but please invite me. But I really need to just focus. And, um, but that's like the thing, the routine. Um, and with Jane, like I was finishing up Jane when lockdown first started, um, you know, which was, was terrible, but also kind of good because it was really distracting. But um, I just, for like the first three weeks of lockdown, my routine was, you know, I telecommuted, which was this whole new experience. So I telecommuted from like seven to four, um, you know, spent some time with, with her and her dad and had dinner and then wrote the Jane Russell book from like 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. And I did that every day for like the first three weeks of lockdown. Um, it's true she did do that. I did do that. So um I'm not saying it's fun, but yeah, I think, you know, if you really want to get it done, you just commit the time. You basically just have to do it. Like you just have to do it. As Joan Crawford said, you don't find time, you make time. And you also say your girl sketch group. I do. I think which Joan was actually friendly with Anne Dvorak, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so as I mentioned, Anne was at MGM from 1929 to 31. And, you know, she was a chorus girl and she was also an assistant choreographer to Sammy Lee for a little while. I was a dance instructor. And so she met Joan. Um, so I think she was, you know, she helped Joan with choreography on films and Joan just took a shine to her and kind of helped, you know, cause Anne, she was 17 when she started at MGM. So she, and she was, you know, she was kind of like a goofy, awkward, adorable teenager. And so Joan really kind of helped her polish her image. Um, there is a resemblance between the two. And so Anne was kind of known on the lot as the, um, you know, that, that dancer that looks like Joan Crawford. And I think Joan legitimately tried to get Anne speaking parts um, at MGM Films. And wow. so, um, yeah, so they actually, I think, were, were quite, quite friendly. I don't know, you know, if they really stayed in touch over the years or not. Um, but yeah, but Joan was absolutely a champion of Anne's early on. It's really cool because that's a kind of a side of Joan you don't often see. Right. No, not at all. But um, yeah, I love Joan. So yeah, it's a nice. Thank you. There's yeah. actually never been a biography that's fully satisfied me about Joan, but apparently I hear there's one coming out this fall. So Is there. Yeah. Yeah. There's been some I've read and there's like bits and pieces, but um, yeah, I think she's, yeah, she, she was wonderful and, and was absolutely quite wonderful to Anne. Wow. That's really cool. Did Anne have other um, women in the industry who helped her, supported her, et cetera? Yeah, I think one of the other big champions that she had was Karen Morley. And so Karen Morley um, was her co-face, co co was her co-star in Scarface. Um, even though they don't actually have any scenes together. But again, so Karen was, you know, um, at MGM. And so her and Anne just absolutely took a shine to her. And Karen absolutely, again, I think. Karen, I think Joan probably had more pull at MGM at the time than Karen Morley did, but Karen also tried to help Anne get parts at MGM and, you know, to no avail. And, and Anne was just on the verge of kind of giving up because I think, you know, even though she was constantly working and I think enjoyed getting the paycheck because her family had kind of, her mom and stepdad had kind of fallen on hard times. She was kind of sick of being a dancer. Um, and then the musical started falling out of fashion. So she ended up just being an extra. So she has these just tiny parts in the background is you know a patron at a cafe or a maid or 
And so she was just getting really, really frustrated and um, was considering just kind of quitting the film industry altogether. And then Karen Morley got signed um, for Scarface. And according to Karen, she was given the given the option of either female role. So there's two female roles in Scarface. So there's Poppy, who's the, you know, the gangster mole um, who dates uh, Paul Muni's character. And then there's Cheska and Cheska is the kid sister of Paul Muni. And Cheska is definitely, I think they're both great roles because they're both incredibly strong women. Um, I think the Cheska role is a little bit meatier, but Morley looked at the two parts and I think would have liked to have done Cheska, but thought, eh, she goes, I, I can pull off Poppy and can play Cheska. And so, mm-hmm. so she, you know, so they started strategizing over, you know, how to get Anne to Howard Hawks. And one night, um, after, you know, after Muni had been cast and George Raft had been cast and Morley, and they were still looking for Cheska because Hawks couldn't find somebody that he liked enough. And he threw a party um, for, because I think he liked to get his actors together so they could have a good rapport. And so he threw a party and Morley called up Anne and said, get dressed, get over here now. And so Anne, you know, had an evening gown, like went over, um, I think was familiar, you know, with the script, knew that Cheska was the love interest of George Raff's character. And at the party zeroed in, I knew George Raff was a dancer and zeroed in on George Raft and like got him on the dance floor. And they did this incredible dance and that caught Hawks's attention. Um, he found out Anne was an actress, gave her, you know, the screen test and she got the part. And that is absolutely because of Karen Morley. And I think over the years, um, it's been said that Joan Crawford helped her get the role in Scarface, which isn't true. So yes, Joan absolutely tried to help Anne advance her career, but it was Karen Morley that really played that pivotal role in getting her in Scarface. And I've always thought that Paul Muni and, and Dvorak had a lot of sexual chemistry in Scarface, even though they play brother and sister. Which they're supposed to. Because there are definitely those like incestuous undertones. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Huge amount of chemistry between the two. They made one other movie, um, Dr. Socrates in 35 over at Warner Brothers. Not quite as good as Scarface, but um, yeah, I think the two of them had great on screen chemistry and I think really um, got along quite well um, off screen. And, and both were in, both lived on ranches in Encino. Oh, very cool. And yeah. you've been to that ranch many times and you got married at the ranch, correct? So, yeah, so in 1934, um, Anne and Leslie Fenton bought around, uh, I can never remember the exact acreage, somewhere between 37 and 52 acres in Encino. It was a walnut ranch and built a home there. And um, so I ended up becoming friends with the fourth owner of the property, um, Dr. Arnie Scheibel. And so, yeah, he let um, my, my husband and I get married there. We got married in 2007. So he has since passed away. Um, but the current owners... Um, I've become friendly with. And so uh, last year I got to take my whole Girl Scout troop um, for a tour of the property because it's, it's still two acres. Um, so most of the land was, you know, Anne started subdividing it um, once her and Leslie Fenton split up. So it's still two acres. There's amazing, just old, wonderful trees. And so I was able to take my Girl Scout troop there last year and an arborist gave us a tour and talked about the trees on the property. So um, yeah, it's still there and still beautiful. Do you mean Anne Dvorak Girl Scout badge? Right. You should make that. You've made a bad before with our troop. I know. Again. Isn't that we we did this? There's this thing called the patrol challenge. It's like this crazy, crazy like Girl Scout, Boy Scout, Scout, like photo scavenger hunt. It's insane. It it's like insane. Months yeah. to do. But it was very touching. The girls decided to call their patrol name the Dvorak Danes of Hollywood Land. So I was very oh, and we made a flag, made flag with Anne. You forgot you did that. So mm-hmm. I was very touched and we had a flag. We had a flag with Anne on it. We'll find the picture. So, um, yes. So anybody in my orbit, no matter what age, knows who Anne Dvorak is, whether they want to or not. <laughs> question for you. Oh, you have a question no, from, or somebody has? The, oh, somebody has a question. Yeah. Okay. Someone said Anne can really bring the pathos to her roles. Three on a match and then they struggle with this one, but someone else should find it. It's a life of her own. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think she drew on to be so effective at this? That's a, gosh, that's a really interesting question. Like, what did Anne draw on to, to bring so much pathos to her um to her roles? Gosh, that you know, that's actually a really interesting question because I don't feel like um her upbringing was. I think there were certainly challenge. There were some challenges in her upbringing, which I think 
we all have, um, you know, she was her, her mother, her parents split when she was really young. So she didn't know her father. So she, you know, probably from about the age of like six until she was in her early twenties, she didn't, her father wasn't in the picture. There were periods of time where she lived with family in New York because her mom was um, making movies splitting her time between making movies in New York and Los Angeles. And so I get the impression that being away from her mother might've been difficult for her as a child. Um, but I, yeah, for her at, you know, when she makes three on a match, you know, she does that in 1932. So she's 20 years old where, what she was drawing from to, to, to play a role like that. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I just really think she had that much kind of raw talent as an actress. And, and interestingly, I have a letter she wrote um, talking about making the film. And she felt like she, she felt like she didn't have enough like worldly experience to be an effective actress. And that was one of the things she said that she needed to go to Europe and start seeing the world to, to have that experience. But she made Scarface and Three on a Match before that. So um, I just think there was a lot, a lot of raw talent. And the other movie they mentioned was A Life, a Life of Her Own with Lana Turner, which I think is, you know, if Anne had a, a, like an Oscar worthy performance, that's the one. I, I, I really think if, it, you know, if there's any movie she should have been nominated for, it should have been a supporting actress for A Life of Her Own. And by that time, um, she, she had been through a lot more and particularly during the war. So, you know, Leslie Benton was, um, he was a British citizen by birth. And so when, you know, Britain gets pulled into war with Germany, he immediately signs up to be in the Royal Navy and goes overseas. And Anne could not stand to be away from him. And so she makes arrangements. She gets passage on a freighter ship and travels through like hostile waters, like with, you know, the, 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 ac the absolute danger of being blown up so she can get to him. She's stranded in Lisbon for a month and then finally gets a flight into London, flies into London during the Blitz. And so she's, you know, in England and she's in the UK from, you know, early 1941 to mid 43. She, you know, drives an ambulance and she's a, a, a you know, a journalist and a broadcaster for the BBC. And so I think during those warrior, like being there, being in a place that is literally getting bombed, um, certainly changed her worldview. And I think once she came back, I think that was one of the big reasons why they ended up getting divorced. It was, I think there, this, 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 this wartime experience and to come back to Hollywood and to try to pick up where they had left off after what they had been through, wasn't something they were able to do and certainly not able to do together. And I think because she wasn't with, even though she went there to be near him, he was still enlisted. And so there were periods of time during the war where she wasn't with him and she ended up doing like um, kind of proto USO tours before there, I think there really was the USO. Um, and so that certainly impacted her. And I think she did suffer from P, you know, PTSD after coming back. And so I think later on those experiences, I think she was certainly drawing, she could certainly draw from that. But early on Scarface and Three on a Match, man, I just think that's raw talent. <laughs> that's like insane raw talent. Well, I think after you go through something like a war, you are not the person that you were before that started. You can't, you couldn't be. No, and certainly not with, you know, and like I said, Leslie Fenton was 10 years older than Anne and they got married when she was so young. And so I think just because of the war, they, they really grew apart during that time period. Um, and I think that was the first time in her life that she was ever truly alone, you know, because she she was you know very close to her mother. So once her mother kind of st stopped acting and they were here in Los Angeles, you know, they came and moved to Los Angeles and you know, her mother had huge influence over her. So she goes from being like really under the thumb of her mother to being under the thumb of her husband. And during the war, that's the first time she ever, you know, truly, I think, has independence and um, which definitely made her a different person. Absolutely. Gable, any of a, any new questions? No, no. There's some the a few people have been saying that it's very interesting to get all these additional insights about her life and stuff on this. Yeah, um, especially people who have gotten the book. Someone else said that um they got to walk around uh the grounds and visit her greenhouse. Oh yeah, and you know that's right. Anne had such a green thumb, and so that she had a greenhouse. And the current owners of the property in Sino, um, they completely restored the greenhouse, so they put a lot of money into that. So, well, do you want me to share a few more things that I've? Yes, please. We love show and tell. I want to see the shredded wheat ad. 
Oh, who knew shredded wheat could be so glamorous? I know. So, if only the glamour of Anne could make it taste better. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for lack of trying on their part, though. I mean, hey. They tried. I bet I bet this sold a few boxes of shredded wheat. Hey, I would have bought shredded wheat if the ads looked like that. Right. Um, so this is a new thing I got in the last few months, um, which was just a, a huge, huge find. So Anne, um, she made three movies as a child. So she was in um, Ramona, uh, which was a um, the Clune, Clune produced film. And that was um, when she was four years old, four or five years old. And then uh, in 1917, she did a movie called The Man Hater. And so I actually recently found a photo of it. Oh, wow. There it is, you can see a very young, that's from, so she was six years old. And so I recently found this photo from the man hater. And it's an original photo, which is just incredibly exciting. Oh, definitely. One of my new, my, one of my new favorite things. And then um, a couple of other things, um, which is kind of cool. I mean, I'm the only person who probably can, and my friend and Darren, Darren Barnes can appreciate this because he's been on the Anne. He actually found these for me. So this is a photo of Anne and Paul Kelly from a television show that she did in 1952. So it was one of those anthology, anthology shows called Selenese Theater. And so this was from an episode called Street Scene, which is kind of crazy to find, um, to find a photo from a TV show. Well, Darren's an excellent detective. Darren's very good. Darren keeps an eye out of all things Anne. And so the things that he comes across. Um, and then, so Anne did one uh, um, one Broadway appearance. So in 1948, um, she was on Broadway in The Respectful Prostitute. The following year, she was, um, she was road showing a show called People Like Us. And the producer was like a huge shyster and the thing just completely like fell apart and like the, the company got like stranded somewhere without any money. Um, but recently Darren also found, so this is a photo with Sydney Blackmere over here. So this is a photo from one of these roadshow performances and people like us, which um, again is like astounding. I don't think anybody could appreciate it quite as much as me, but this is a crazy photo. That's insane. So and Darren bought it a while back and I actually forgot I had it and I was organizing my stuff. And then another, um, this is another recent purchase, which I think is just beautiful. Um, so these pieces are unfortunately called midget window cards. Um, so they're smaller versions you know, of the large window cards, um, but it's such beautiful, I mean, I guess that's supposed to be Anne, but it's such beautiful artwork from um, Bright Lights, 1935, Warner Brothers with Joey Brown. So those oh, wow. are cool things. So anything else, Judy? Mm -mm. No. Oh, there's someone oh. uh before who said um they like to spot Anne and MGM films that she did with Robert Montgomery. Oh yeah, finding so that's one of my favorite things is spot spot an Anne and when she's in the MGM yeah. chorus, um, which I actually was doing it with her because I I probably have a couple hundred photos of Anne in MGM films as a chorus girl. And so that's that that that's a fun game we were playing the other night is can you spot Anne? Can you spot I got yeah. almost all of them right. You're pretty good at it. And I, she really stands out. So when you you know when you're watching these films, so anything, you know, a film that's between 29 and 31 that has a chorus, there's a pretty good chance Anne's gonna be there. But she really stands out. And, you know, even though I think she ultimately, you know, thought it was kind of boring, um, she always gives it her all. So, you know, just look for the girl who's just like flailing her arms like the hardest and smiling the biggest. And that is Anne. But yeah, I agree. It is fun to try to spot her in films. And, you know, and I still come across films that, you know, I thought I like had found them all. And Every so a couple of years back, or, or right before lockdown, I discovered like two more MGM films where she's in one of them. There was um, the Phantom of Paris. Um, John was, Gilbert's in that, right? John Gilbert, yeah. And she she she's plays a servant in his house. So he like, walks past a row of servants, and she's one of them, and has like one line, which was crazy. And then there was another movie called The Great Meadow. And she's in some village dancing. So there's still, it's never ending 20, 26 years later. And like the, you know, the collecting and, and, and the Anne spottings are never ending. So, Very cool. yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for Hollywood Kitchen. I really appreciate it. It's always so much fun to talk to you. 
and find out what's going on with you, your work, and of course with Anne. Thank you so much. I always appreciate the opportunity to talk about Anne. I don't get asked about her quite so much anymore since the book came out almost 10 years ago, which is amazing. Um, I don't know how sick of you, how sick of Anne are you? Gable spent her entire life being My entire surrounded. life, just Anne. Oh, she knows. There's file cabinets over there that have just been there my entire life that are just stacked to the brim with Anne. And you did let me read my book to you when you were yep. four. Yeah, you read to me when you were four and you read to me again when you were, when I was like eight or something. We've read it twice? Mm -hmm. oh, I think we're it another time. No, we're not. Mm -hmm. I remember it. Okay. Gable has a very singular and unique childhood experience. I, I agree. And the Warak is the childhood there's experience. That, there's also a lot of Disneyland. And Jane Russell now. And Jane Russell. And Russell. Russell. There you go. The worst way Four thing. I, I really can. So you're, you're doing all right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thanks to everybody for tuning in and listening to me ramble, ramble on about Anne. And you guys are always welcome to contact me and ask me Anne questions. Yes. And does Larry Edmonds still carry your book? Yeah, they do. I think he has... Last time he was there, I think he has still had a couple of copies left and they're and they're signed. So they're already autographed. But if you want them personalized, I live 10 minutes away from Larry Edmonds. So I'll go down. <laughs> Just tell Jeff that you want them signed, that you want it personalized. And I'm more than happy to run down and do that. Excellent. Well, Gable and Christina and Anne, Anne. thank you so much for joining us. Please stay tuned for more food, fun, and film history from Hollywood Kitchen.